Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Pastor Don Weekly Podcast Show. Again, I want to thank you so very much for joining me and listening to my weekly devotional today, anywhere on social media, from Spreaker to Facebook to Google, YouTube, anywhere. I am just glad you are with us. So, because each and every week, I bring you a Bible teaching that, in my hope, builds you up in Christ. Before I start on my opening monologue for today, I want to welcome and say good morning to Donovan. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great. Uh, great Labor Day weekend. I hope you had a lot of barbecue. I did. Yes. We did have a barbecue yesterday. It was a great service on Sunday. It was nice, nice weekend. It was cooler. Yeah. It's summer's officially over. Uh, it? But it's supposed to get warmer this weekend. It's supposed to be in the hundreds again. But you know what? It was an awesome weekend. So let me get started on my opening thoughts. You know, last week was an inspiring and Very popular opening monologue. It was not because of what I said. It's not because of my oratory skills. That's for sure. It was about the subject. The subject of the millennium and what God's plans are for his church in this thousand year time frame. You could not listen to that podcast and not have a smile on your face in knowing that God's got these amazing and wonderful plans for us in the future. Now, if you missed last week's podcast, you can always check it out on YouTube, News from the Edgemont, Pastor Don Weekly Devotional, or you can just go on the Reflections Ministry page. You can listen to the audio portion of that podcast from last week. Now, this morning, we're going to take a look at what happens after the thousand-year millennium is over. Now, if you've never read this in scriptures, or you don't know what exactly will happen, this next few minutes might surprise you. We learn that after the thousand-year millennium is complete, Satan will be set free, but only for a short time. How do we know that? Let's take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 7, excuse me, chapter 20, starting in verse 7. Revelation 20, starting in verse 7, says, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they will look like sands on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and and surround the camp of God's people, the city that he loves. But fire comes down from heaven and devours them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had previously been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hard to believe that God will make the decision to release Satan after the thousand years. And it's even harder to believe that Satan will be able to round up enough people in order to try to fight God once again. But before I get into that, I want to ask you guys a question. Well, I was Donovan first. Do you like that TV show Law and Order? Mm, the, the earlier stages, the earlier incarnations. Yeah. The earlier ones are probably better than the later, but I used to be a, I used to be a very huge Law and Order fan. It was, one, it was one of my favorite TV drama shows, especially the SVU. Right. Because it's just, just a, such a different type of precinct in, in, within the police force. It is one of the two cop shows I've really enjoyed. And it's interesting that I noticed on many of the episodes on Law & Order, specifically uh, SVU, Special Victims Unit, is that normally in a, sh- a lot of these shows, the detective would catch a child rapist, or a detective would catch a murderer or an abuser at the beginning of the show only to have to release the criminal in the middle of the show because of a technicality, because of a glitch, or because lack of evidence. Then the the detectives have to spend the rest of the show trying to find more evidence in order to put the bad guy back in jail. But in the meantime, that released villain is free to do exactly what he was doing before, abusing kids, raping women, or killing people. Then they usually catch the person again at the end of the show, and of course, everyone lives happily ever after. Well, you might be thinking that that is just a TV show and not real life. But in regards to the verses that I just read you from Revelation chapter 20 during the time of this millennium, it's kind of the exact same thing is going to happen. As you know, the devil Satan has been a liar and a deceiver and the great accuser for over 6,000 years on this earth. He has caused more evil in this world than any other influence. 
And finally, after all this time of doing all this destruction against so many people, including you and me, God seizes this dragon, binds him up, and sends him into a bottomless pit. Problem solved. But then after the thousand-year millennium, God does something strange. He releases Satan from the abyss. So you, I'm thinking to myself, and you might be thinking the same thing, why? Why would God do this? God does this to prove to you and me that even in the perfect world, even under the most perfect conditions, man's heart are still attracted to evil. Let me show you what I mean. For a thousand years in this millennium, there would have been no Satan to tempt us in this time. There have been no demons to torment us during this time. On this earth, there had been no sickness, no poverty, no hunger, no chaos, and basically, no danger. Also, during this time, there's been no more fear or evil. Because Jesus will be ruling on this earth during that time in perfect order. And yet, <clears throat> after the thousand years, Satan is able to gather an army, as many as the number of sands on the seashore, and if you think about that, that's a countless amount of people to fight against God. So exactly what does that mean? It means that even in a perfect world, in a perfect environment, with a perfect rule, man's heart will still rather desire evil over good. You need to understand how this works. You and I, as part of this church, will be in our glorified bodies. The Old Testament saints will rise at the end of the tribulation and they will be in their glorified bodies. The tribulation saints that died within the seven year period will rise at this at the end of the uh, tribulation time period and they will also be in their glorified states. But all those people who survive the seven year tribulation, we're talking millions of people because you need to remember the only ones that die for sure is all the armies of the world that come up against God in the battle of Armageddon. But there's still going to be millions of people around that will survive this seven year ordeal that did not take the mark of the beast. What happens to those people? They come to this new earth with Jesus as rule, but they're not in glorified bodies. They're in their own natural bodies as we are today. So they are able to repopulate this earth. And like I said last week, in a perfect conditions, Garden of Eden type conditions, these people are going to live longer lives. Living a hundred years will be like living as a child. People will be living lives as prior to the flood of Noah's Ark. So people is going to be living longer, there'll be more births, there'll be so many more people on this earth, and no one will be perishing. So what's going to happen to the population? It's going to explode. So now you can see where we could have as many people as the sands in the seashore. But the problem that is scary for me, and I'm sure it is for you too, Donovan, is why would these people side with Satan during this time to try to fight God when they've been under God's rule for the entire thousand years. Mm. And you know God's rule is perfect. He, yes, he would be ruling with an iron scepter, but he'll be ruling righteously. He will be ruling biblically. He'll be ruling godless, godful, totally God-filled. And yet people will reject that in their natural bodies and desire evil over good. What that tells me is that the heart of people are just evil. And this proves it at the end of this millennium. But here's the great news. The great news is that God does defeat Satan and his enemies for good. And it really wasn't a fight. It was just kind of like the Battle of Armageddon. <laughs> he does it with fire from heaven. But this helps you and I re to realize how, pers or how powerful and powerfully sinful our personal spirit is. Even in the best possible scenario, man in their natural state will still rather turn towards evil rather than turning towards God. I guess Jeremiah 17.9 is true. Jer Jeremiah 17.9 says it best, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So what does that mean for you and I today? The potential of even our heart and spirit to turn into evil is great. That is why 
It is so important that we surrender each day to the Holy Spirit inside of us and allow God to lead us. Don't let our hearts, who is evil, lead us. Allow the Spirit of the Lord to lead us. We need the light of Jesus to shine through us to others and not allow sin and temptation and evil to consume us. It is so easy to go off the road and away from the Lord. So that's why each day is a blessing from God, but we got to allow God to be the leader of us. Because if we don't, it, temptations will lead us away from Him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, folks, there you have it. This is just a small taste of what you and I have to look forward to in the millennium. Let me explain it one more time because I want to leave this in a positive note. You and I, as part of the church, will be in our glorified bodies. We will be reigning as kings and priests in Jesus, with Jesus ruling under the kingship of our Lord and Savior. Satan, in those thousand years, will be bound in a bottomless pit. Jesus will rule on this earth in obedience to his word. There will be no tears, no evil, no pain, no destruction, and no wars. But then after Satan is released after a thousand years, God will quickly destroy him and those that follow him and put Satan where he belongs into the lake of fire for eternity. Folks, the millennium time period that God describes in Revelation will be a glorious time for all believers. We need to praise God for all his blessings and amazing promises that he gives us in his word. I know it's hard to imagine a life like this. It's hard to imagine a day without battles, wars, depression, pain, evil. It's hard. We can't even imagine, especially now in this 21st century. But God says it in his word. And when God says it, we can believe it. Mm -hmm. Folks, God has a great plan for you and I. Let's rejoice and be glad. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, first of all, we thank you so much for the promises in your word. Our minds cannot imagine a world with no pain, no tears, no wars, and no evil. Lord, we cannot imagine an earth with no smog, no pollution, and just amazing Garden of Eden-like beauty. And our minds can't believe in these perfect conditions that there still would be a huge army wanting to fight against you after the millennium. Lord, all we can say is that we don't deserve your amazing grace. We don't deserve your incredible mercy and perfect love, but we are so grateful for everything that you do for us now and for your plans for the future. Lord, all we can humbly say is thank you from the depths of our hearts, and we want to take each day to give you glory, praise, and worship. Lord, we love you with all we have, and we continue to allow you to lead us in what we do. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's opening monologue on the activities after the millennium. So you might be thinking, you're going to be surprised. But I'm going to tell you it's one that you do not want to miss. Because it's something that you're going to see what's going on in this world today versus what the Bible teaches from way back when and how it's parallel going forward. It's just amazing to watch the, uh, the, the Bible open it up right before our eyes. We're going to take a look at that starting next week. I want to thank you guys all so much for sharing and being a part of my Reflections Ministry Facebook page. It's growing and growing each and every week, and it's because of you, because of all the shares. You know, I don't know if I told you this, Donovan, but we average over a, a hundred shares for a very small devotional page. We average over a hundred shares every single day, and that's you, the audience, who's doing that. I ask you to continue to share, and then encourage your friends and family to share to their friends and family, and Lord, getting this message out to as many people as, you, as we can. Again, if you've never heard of it, it's called Reflections Ministries Facebook page. Go on it, check it out, like it, follow it, and then, of course, enjoy the devotionals and share it with everyone you know. God bless you, God bless your family, and thank you for, this, for listening to my opening monologue. All right, once again, um, that, that last part you uh, gave about the uh, Satan coming out for a thousand years, 
Now, is that God's way of basically saying, okay, I'm giving you another chance. I love you guys so much. I'm giving you another chance to make sure it's all good and great before I'm done. Well, you know, I, I that's a great question. I, I, I struggle understanding why God does certain things that God does. And of course, I have a, a very small mind and God's, you know, infinitely wisdom. But I, I think one of the things that God is trying to show all of us is that you know what people are great at doing? Making excuses. Right, hypocritical. We are so good at making excuses. There's always a reason why we don't do something right, we fail at something, something doesn't go right on. It's never us, it's always something else. Well, I think what God is trying to... Sounds like a president of ours. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. well, I don't want to go there, but it's kind of like what God is saying here, is, hey, look at this. I gave you the perfect conditions. I gave you the Garden of Eden type setting. I got a perfect rule, biblically perfect rule. Everything that you've ever dreamed about is right in front of you. And I've given you a thousand years to enjoy it and grow your family, all this stuff. And yet, even with all that, that's how evil our hearts are. You can't even take all that and go forward with, with the Lord because we'd rather be evil and do things against the word of God. And I think that's the point. It's the point is it doesn't matter how great life is. Mm-hmm. It almost goes back to that, the, the thing in, um, in Luke 16 where the, 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 one of the uh, guys dies, uh, an evil person dies, and there was a beggar who went to a paradise, and then the, uh, the, e- the evil rich man uh, went to torments, basically. And he said, and he said to the uh, angel, uh, can I go back to earth and warn my five brothers about right. what this outcome and what the angel says, it wouldn't make any difference because they wouldn't believe you even if you raised right. yourself from the earth. Same thing. People don't believe because hearts are evil. Hearts, hearts unfortunately, turn towards the negative over God. So I think it's just proving a point that no matter what, people always turn more towards the negative than they will turn towards God. Or um, and, uh, there's a lot, a lot of people that, that say, um, you know, with these oligarchs and these billionaires and all these people, you know, accumulating all this wealth, these few people, uh, that they're making their heaven here on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Versus everybody, you know, the majority of us who are like, you know, we go to pastors and we've got this, these stories in the Bible that say, oh yeah, no matter how much you suffer here, when you get to heaven, it'll be great. You'll get your mansion, your Mercedes and all that other good stuff. No, but well, you, you, know, you, you know where I'm going with that? I right? really do. Yeah. And you know, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I kind of want to bring this up and I don't want to, again, my goal in this show is always to edify, yeah, but, edify but I, but you know, I, I was a little bit bothered, you know, mm-hmm. you know, this week has been, has been, you know, basically saturated with the John McCain uh, right, okay. Funeral mm-hmm. and you know memorial service and and, and I'm and the Aretha. first. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to talk more about John McCain okay. than Aretha because John McCain, you know, I I respect John McCain as a, as a, as a um he was a, a fighter he was he was in our military POW for five mm-hmm. and a half years mm-hmm. I respect everything that that man tried to do mm-hmm. he sacrificed a lot the part that I struggle with a little bit is the fact that his memorial service actually lasted a full week yeah. with all the honors and all the, you know, the rotunda, the going in and, and, and having another memorial yeah. service. He's in Arizona. Arizona, Washington, D.C. It's all right. this other stuff. And I kept thinking to myself, he just got all his glory again here on earth. You know, a lot of pastors like to kind of do the same thing. They like to show how great their church is based on their numbers, mm-hmm. based on how big their church structure is, mm-hmm. based on all the ministries they support. And that's all great because then everybody praises them, praises mm-hmm. their church, praises their ministry, praises them for obviously being a great pastor. So they're getting a lot of their attention, positive attention. here. But what does Jesus teach? Jesus teaches one thing. Bring the people to me. Right. In other words, they should even know your name. Mm-hmm. When they think, well, how did you find Christ in your life? You say it's all about God in my heart. It's not about a pastor. It's not about a person because it's not about us. It's about leading people to Christ. If not one person remembers my name, but they remember that they gave their life to Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. that's all that matters. Wow. It's not about us. And so many of us, I saw John McCain again, nothing but respect and love for a man who loved this country. But you know, a full week, you know, Jesus wouldn't even have gotten that much pomp, you know, if he came into the 21st century. 
And the goal that we need to remember is, as Christians, is people don't need to remember us. Mm-hmm. You know what? We're yeah, just, glory to God. we're just, <laughs> yeah, we're just people that God instruments that God uses in order to give glory to Him. People need to remember Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We need to, you know, attract people to Jesus, not to us. We go away, but Jesus lives on forever. And that's, and I, and I kind of, and, and, and like I said, not negative against uh, John McCain. You know, he got a lot more than, you know, Aretha Franklin. And Aretha Franklin, she sang for the Lord. I mean, she was a God-centered woman, but it was just a little, to me, it was just a little bit too much. And I wish that they would have just backed off a little bit and been a little bit more about, because I know he's a Christian man. Sure. And it'll be a little bit more about God. But you know what? We need to realize what our mission is on earth is to lead people to Christ and Christ alone. Not for our own benefit or for our own ego, but for Christ alone. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought the John McCain thing because you also know that they used that as a political tool. They did. You know, a they did. Tool. And, and it's so sad because that's why when um, I'm a firm believer in separation of church and state. When I see pastors that want to, you know, be up there with the president and all this I, other I, stuff. That's the that those are the religious people that Jesus said before he sent into heaven to avoid. Yeah, and that's for. it's kind of a little pet peeve I have. You know, I I do believe. You know, I believe we all have our opinions on things, and that's okay. But I do believe. You know, in our churches, in our Bible studies, and in our, in our Christ centered settings. The focus has got to be on Christ, Christ. not on politics, not on right. you love Trump, you hate Trump, you love yeah. McCain. It, you know, it doesn't matter. We all have our opinions and your opinions matter mm-hmm. in those settings, not when we're talking about, you know, the, the Bible and the house of the Lord. Exactly. It's got to be all about Christ and Christ alone. And yeah, I hear a lot of these, you know, pastors says, no, no, we have to go out there and be the political leaders. We've got people for that. Yeah, we've got people for that. We need to be the Christ-centered leaders and say, you know what, whatever, we're going to respect our leaders, we're going to pray for our leaders, but we're going to we're going to pump up Christ well, in people's lives. You know, and and then you know, it's really sad when when you see pastors doing that because even the Pharisees, they were religious guys that were leaders oh, in huge. that, and they were so corrupted. Remember, Jesus was a young man, a, 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 a teenager or whatever, a kid, and he was calling them out like, At hey, twelve years old. Yeah, you exactly. You know, all this coin and all this ceremony, that don't mean anything to my father. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. Again, it's getting the right focus. It's it, the focus when, for people that are consider themselves strong Christians, pastors, leaders, preachers, whatever. It's got to be Christ. Christ alone. Not anything else because it does, all that does is takes us away from our mission. And the mission is... More distraction. Is, and, I think more Satan, distraction. and I think Satan you know, uses that. To keep us at each other's throat. You're a Democrat. You're a Republican. You're a communist. You're this or you're that. Exactly. You know, we're all people. Yeah, exactly. And again, we got to understand our role. Our role is not. I'm, my, my role is not to change the world. I'm not going to change anybody. Mm-hmm. My role is to lead people to Christ. That's my role. Right, and like I said, you could forget me the day I die, and that's okay. As long as you remember Christ, mm-hmm. and as long as you follow Christ, then it's okay. That's what it's all about. Exactly. And I, I think a lot of us forget that in our I emotions. Think, I think a lot of pastors forget that. I think a lot of high, high um, um, recognizable people in the faith, you know, I, I call them high recognizable. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what if Al Sharpton is a pastor or a reverend. I'm not sure what these people are. Jesse Jack. I'm not sure what they are. And I'm not judging them. No, I don't judge know them. them. Please judge them. Uh, I, I can't do that. <laughs> no. but, but again, when I see them and all they're doing is getting their face in, 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 you know, on camera for these different actions, political political actions or these yeah. these funerals and all that stuff I'm thinking how's that leading people to Christ right and you know and it's kind of funny like I said I I, I, I didn't watch the Aretha thing it was 10 hours of worth of stuff yeah That's I didn't see that much of it either but um, in the black community it is it, you know it is so funny how we will take a man like the and I hate I don't hate I'm sorry I don't like the way I mean, isn't there some kind of repercussion when you're a reverend and you've got the title of reverend? Can't they take that from you when you do something against, you know, I mean, because it's kind of stupid to have this person up front who has a child out of wedlock that he tried to hide and all the other nefarious things that he did. But, you know, uh, black people, we are so forgiving that we will take these urchins and I call them urchins, like sea urchins, the bottom of the, the sea. And we'll put them up there like they're still leaders and they're still somebody that, you know, people should listen to. Well, I, I, again, and I don't think it's just relative to the, the black past. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of white right. and Hispanic and others that mm-hmm. fall into that category. Because you don't always think about if Jesus was sitting at that funeral mm-hmm. or if Jesus was sitting listening to those type of individuals, what would he be thinking? Would he be thinking, you're my child, you're doing the, the, the work that I'm asking you to do? Or would he be thinking, who are you? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? 
How are you leading these people closer to me? How are you spreading the gospel? And you start seeing that. And, I, you know, I do that a lot, Donovan, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big judger. I don't right. judge people, and I don't, Just you know. Just retrospect when you're sitting around. You know, you see it, and you don't like things, but, you know, that's their life. Let them do what they want to do. But I do that a lot in thinking, what would Jesus, if he was sitting right, right. there, think about right. what I'm doing right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would he be proud? Would he be saying, Don, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? You know, how's that bringing me glory? Just because you're getting more notoriety and I'm getting none. And that's the part I struggle with. Because like you said, and you said a great point. If you're going to call yourself a reverend, if you're going to call yourself a pastor, father as a bishop. priest, bishop, cardinal, Whatever. it doesn't matter what you, if you're going to give yourself that fancy title, title then you got to live up to what the responsibilities of that title Thank means, you. which is Christ and Christ alone. And that's the key for me is that the title to me means nothing. Mm -hmm. You call me what you call me my name, but don't titles doesn't mean anything. Is what I'm doing pleasing to the Lord? And sometimes I see some of these folks in the you know the black community and the white Hispanic community, and I just shake my head, going, "What are you doing? Right. Why are you doing that when it's not bringing glory to God?" Well, you know, and here's the funny thing. Um, I'm glad we're, we're actually talking about this. Cause I want to get this off my chest. People look at in our in our community here in Moreno Valley in the Inland Empire. People look at what you're doing. And you've got some pastors out there who have super churches. And, I mean, I was talking to one Thursday. Mm -hmm. And he was like, man, uh, you know, I'm not a numbers guy. You're a numbers guy. But, you know, mm -hmm. but obviously, people say that they don't watch the, your show. They actually watch the show, but they don't watch. I do, I do know <laughs> yeah. a lot of people that do right. watch the show. <laughs> right. But they, but they say that they don't. Sure. But, you know. And, Ego thing, yeah. Yeah. And, and they're like, you know, what can I do to get my numbers up? I guess they, they're looking at your page. And I want to give the person I was talking to away. However, and you know, he's, he's talking to me and I'm just a regular guy that just helps out a pastor and a, a man of a Christ. lot of help. <laughs> and, and he's, you know, he kept asking me like, what, like there's some kind of secret, there's some kind of secret. And, and I was like this in my head, I didn't reply to him, but I said, if you would walk more Christ-like, maybe you will get that same blessing that Pastor Don is getting. And Pastor Don has put in the work. I mean, he was broken down. To where it was like, you have to start from scratch. You've got to start from the, the very bottom. bottom. And very work your bottom. way up. And you're still working. Yeah. And, and again, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of, I've had actually pastors ask me similar questions. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and, and they do it in a very respectful, yeah. very positive way. I, love, I like your show, blah, blah, yeah. blah. How can I get started? Mm -hmm. And it's not something that you just say, I'm going to get started. Yeah. It's something that you pray about. I prayed about this for weeks before I even met this man. And I didn't even know he was going to be a part of this. I prayed for God to open up a door. And like I mentioned this a few times, I'll mention it one more time. And the only reason why I did that is because I was so annoyed with my own church doing nothing from Monday through Saturday that I had to do something. What can to, I do to, to uh, nourish the flock? On Monday through Saturday, because they go to church and put their hour and check it off the box, and then God's gone until the following Sunday. Couldn't stand that, so I had to do something to get them off, you know, off the, off the dime to do something for the Lord every single day. And but I didn't know what to do. And I said, God, do something, help me. And it took a few months. And then that's when he brought yeah. Donovan into my life, and we started, you know, looking at doing these devotionals and podcasts and stuff like that. But it's not something I just, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to meet this guy, and I'm going to start you know, at the top. Start about, it doesn't work that way. It starts with soaking prayer. It's, it starts with, Lord, put the right people in my life that I can get something done for your glory. And then you wait, and you wait right. for God's time, and that's what happened. Right. And, and I, I, I actually, it's, you know, and, and I, I agree with what you just said, but you actually put the Lord first exactly. in what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot that's of people. That's the secret. They don't. And that's very true because a lot of people want to do this because of their own prestige, their right, own right. ego. They I want, want maybe more followers. They, I want this. they want more followers. They want to sell advertising mm -hmm. on their page so they can make more money. Mm -hmm. I mean, they want to put a donate so they can yeah. have more cash. It, it was, it's always done for a lot of different reasons. If you look at Reflections Ministry Facebook page, there's, there's nothing. No donate button. There's, there's no donate nothing. Button. <laughs> the only thing that's on there is basically the fact that you. I want you to be edified in Christ, and that is it. It's got to be the motives. Has got to be Christ centered. Right. Now I got it. I'm going to be honest with you, folks. My books that are being published are coming out in about two months. Oh, right so I may have a, it's not a donate, but it's, it's a buy the books or learn more about the books button mm -hmm. that could be on the Reflections page. Mm -hmm. But it has, but there's value to that. Okay. So it's not just donating to, you know, to a, you know, to a church type thing. But anyways, it, yeah. And, and again, you can't think like, you know, and I'm just going to start this thing. I'm going to be having 10,000 people watching like Pastor Don. It doesn't work it that doesn't way. It doesn't work that way. At it all. is a process 
And it's got to be done in a way that honors Christ alone and not yourself. And I, and I think that is why you're successful because you're doing it because the Lord has told you this is the vehicle that you are going to use. It's not about Pastor Don. You're, you're teaching something a lot of pastors don't do, which I think the Lord has put you in this position because a lot of people were like, whoa, I love that series and da 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 da. Mm-hmm. He's not doing it for the Pastor Don. Oh, it's about me, 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 me. He's doing it because the Lord put you in this position and said, hey, because and yeah, I appreciate that, and 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 he's right though, because there's not a lot of pastors talking about end times, and a lot of people are so confused, and most of the times the things that they think end times is about is not even in the Bible. So having this series that allows you to at least have a different view, I'm not selling it to anybody. I'm not you know forcing you to believe everything I say because I'm so brilliant. Check it out for yourself. Read the Bible, read Revelation, read Matthew 24, and f- figure out for yourself what you think God is teaching us in those passages, and then make your own decision. But at least this gives you a, f- a-, a foundation here to be able to at least go to that next level to do your own studying on your own. Right, now, uh, back to the uh, thousand years. Do, why do you think he's going to release Satan for that time? Why, why can't he just destroy Satan Right off the bat, and so we could all live happily ever after. Yeah, and, and I think it goes back to what I mentioned in regard to and just just proving the point mm-hmm. that it doesn't really matter, even in the most perfect conditions, that man's heart's evil. I think it just proves that point, even in perfect conditions. I mean, I, I can't. I with the audience right now, I cannot cannot even imagine one full week of no pain, no suffering, no stress, no worries, no fighting. No, no you can't even picture one week, let alone a thousand right. years. And yet that's what it's going to be like, and it's still not enough. So I think God says, okay, I'm going to prove to you guys. I'm going to release Satan, and look what happens. As many army as the sands of the seashore. How many sands are in the seashore? I can't count yeah, that high. I don't have yeah, enough zeros to enough, put it. Yeah. There's not enough numbers. So can you imagine being able to raise that many people that's anti-God? Kind of reminds you where we're at today <laughs> type thing. But it proves that point, and I think that's what it is. God's proving a point. Of course, it takes... a a nanosecond to destroy it and fire from heaven. But again, it proves to us, no matter what, living the life Christ for us, it's just not there with our, with our evil heart. Well, I, well I'm going to say this, um, and I challenge everybody out there, if you're going through any kind of struggles or uh, financial issues or, you know, uh, you need to prayer for a loved one. By the way, my grandfather made 95 years old. Oh, praise the Lord. That's I awesome. Think, I think he's 96, but, you know, back in those days, hard to keep the records right. But we, we That's awesome. Like it. That is awesome. Uh, he's 95, still walking and doing his thing and having a good time. He went to go party. He had a party somewhere. Oh, God. And, good for uh, him. So he's doing his thing. Good but, for him. Um, but if you're suffering and you're going through anything, I challenge you. Give it to God and see what happens. Amen. I'll tell you this. Sometimes God's the last resort. Mm-hmm. He needs to be the first, first resort. resort but, but make him a resort. Right. I mean, make, and go to God and allow him to build you up. Let him comfort you. Give you strength to go forward. And I'm telling you, it, it, it works. I mean, really, I mean, and that's the thing. you got to believe it. Yeah, it, it if, works. You know, this isn't a movie. If you're just like, oh, yeah, that could happen in a movie. You know, that, I mean, come on. You, you know, I mean... I could take the next 5, 10, 15 um, uh, podcasts mm-hmm. and tell you stories of people that I know. And I've got a very small church mm-hmm. of people that have been touched by God and lives change. Sure. This is real stuff. God is in the healing business. God wants to do miracles in your life. We just got to surrender to him. All right. And um, by you guys uh, sharing and doing all that, let God be your uh, voice box. It's like he told Aaron, Moses, I know you, you got a stuttering problem. Let your brother speak for you initially dealing with Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. And then as time went on, Moses became a okay speaker. Well, speaking of Moses, last week I asked Donovan the question. Yes. I said, Donovan, who would, who of all the Old Testament characters, which there's literally thousands of Old Testament characters um, that we are exposed to, in those, in those 39 books, which one of them is the one that you can relate to the most or which one do you actually like the most in regards to someone that you can really, you know, really understand and, you know, relate to well? And last week, if you remember, um, Donovan mentioned Moses. Moses. And for good reason. Moses was flawed. So are we. We're all flawed. Moses also knew his limitations, what he can do. He knew that he wasn't a great orator. He knew that he had fear. He knew a lot of things about his life. So he was, he was conscious of what, what, of what the type of person he was. 
But the key was is Moses was faithful. And Moses did what God, he was obedient. He was faithful to the Lord. He was faithful with the Pharaoh. He was faithful in the desert. Everything that Moses did was God-centered. He got over his fears. He became strong in his faith once he recognized, you know, what God was doing through him. Moses is a perfect example of a leader that I would love to be like. Someone, yeah, knows his limitations, but is continuously faithful. So the question I'm going to ask, I'm going to take Donovan off the hook today, because okay. I'll do it next week, is I was going to describe to you who one of my favorite Old Testament characters is. Now, he's not one of the biggies. You know, the biggies you look at it from Old Testament, when you think of Old Testament men, you mostly think Adam, you think uh, Joseph and Moses and David. I mean, those are the biggies, Noah. per se. Oh, of course, Noah and the Ark. But I want to describe a character that I've always admired, and it's a book in the Bible that I've probably, except for the book of Revelation, I've taught on this book more than any other Old Testament book. And that is the character Daniel. Mm. And I want to tell you why I really admire and enjoy the book of Daniel, and I admire this character. First of all, Daniel was completely obedient. If you look at Daniel chapter 1, he was a young man basically living his life, and then busy, he was ransomed. I mean, he was, he was taken by, by force, you know, by Nebuchadnezzar, by the Babylonian, um, uh, Babylonian army. He was put in captivity, but he was a young, strong man, and he had his buddies, three of his buddies. But he decided that he was going to eat veg vegetables and water versus eating the king's steak and lobster each and every night and the wines that they did because he, they, those um, foods were actually sacrificed first to the pagan yeah, gods. Yeah, and he thought that, in his mind, that's going against his devotion to the one true God, and he did not want to participate in that. So he told the king's uh, um, uh, men, his king's court, don't give me that good food, give me the vegetables and waters, I guarantee you I'll be stronger and looking better than everybody else, <laughs> eating the other stuff, and of course, it happened. But it was his devotion to God. He didn't sacrifice his principles just because he was allowed to have the great things of this life. And I look at the world today. You know, do we sometimes um, go after the things of this world, all the, the um, you know, the, the great things that we could have in this world, but we sacrifice our faith? Mm -hmm. And Daniel made the decision, no, I'm going to honor God with my body. I'm going to honor God with my mind. And that's what he did. That's one of the reasons I love Daniel. Number two is his faith under fire. I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I'm going to just tell Donovan. I mean, let's be let's be honest, and and, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, no, but good. I am going to put you on the spot. If I had a guy, we're here in your studio right now. If I had a guy break into your house right now, break into this door, take you by the by the, by the chokehold and mm -hmm. put a gun to your head and say, either you tell me that Jesus is a liar and Jesus is not the Savior, or I'm going to shoot you in the head right now, what would you do? I would say Jesus is, is uh, uh, no, I, I wouldn't even do that. Well, me, I, it's hard. That's hard. But It's not even a fair question. Yeah, it is that, not hard. even a fair question. But see, that's where Daniel yes. was. Mm -hmm. Daniel basically said, if you pray in the open to anyone but the, the, the king sure. of Babylon, and if right. you pray and you get caught, right. you're going to be thrown into the lion's den. With, you got eight lions in there that's ready to devour you. And what does Daniel do? He doesn't even pray in in, in, in private, he opens all the windows, all the doors, so everybody gets that he's praying to the one true God. And he realized what the consequences was going to be on that. He didn't care mm -hmm. because he trusted God. His right. faith in fire was amazing. I want that faith. Yeah, I want to know good. that if I'm in that fireplace and I'm, you know, it's a life or death type thing, I will never um, relinquish my love and devotion for the Lord for anything that this world is going to do to me. And that's what Daniel does. And it's, it's just something that I admire. And then lastly, that I love about Daniel is the fact that he was a prayer warrior. Mm. He was always praying. 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 You go to, I think it's Daniel chapter 8, and, he, and he's just praying. He's praying for his people. He's praying for himself. He's praying for the future of Israel, the future of the Jews. He's, he's almost sick to his, he's sick to his body because he was so concerned about how these people have done so negative against God. This man loved to pray. He did it consistently and persistently. He was a man after God's own heart when it comes to his passionate prayer. And then, of course, the angel came down from heaven and, of course, answered that prayer and gave him that uh, beautiful prophecy from chapters 9 through 11 that you can read on in, in, in the book of Daniel. But it was his faithfulness and his prayer that, um, that's just so admirable. So 
One of my favorite Old Testament characters is the is 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 this uh, man Daniel. I want you to see how you relate to him. Are you completely obedient to God's word, no matter what, no matter what your friends, family, or anybody else may tell you to do? Otherwise, are you obedient to what God teaches? And then, secondly, how is your faith under fire? Is your faith strong only in the good times? Or when you're going through struggles with your finances, your health, relationships, going through tough, tough times, is your faith still strong? Is your faith and trust in the Lord still on fire? Or does it, del- does it go down a little bit because you feel that God isn't answering your prayers? And then lastly, are you a prayer warrior? Mm. Are you giving your, are you, Praying to God no matter what, no matter how busy you are, no matter how tired you are, no matter what's going on in your life, you put God first in regards to praying to Him before anything else. This is the character, what Daniel was all about. I want to be more like Daniel. I'm not there. I'll tell you, I am very flawed and I wish I could be that type of man that no matter what, I'm committed a million percent to God. I am. But I haven't been put under the fire like Daniel was. Right. And I've never been in his in his shoes. I pray that I would react the exact same way he would. But I want that faith. I want that obedience. And I want to be that type of prayer warrior. Wow. Wow. That's, that's yeah, Daniel's a, a very powerful person. You know, I, I, you know, and it's funny because, like, you think about the big wigs and nobody thinks mm-hmm. about, like, Daniel and some of the other prophets. It's an amazing book. If you've never read the book of Daniel or maybe just uh, skimmed through it, Either take a commentary and read it or read it on your own and really appreciate what that book is all about. Not only for the prophecies in the later portion of the book, but the faith and love and devotion that him and his three buddies had for our Lord. It's yeah. just a, it's just really an, an amazing book. Yeah, I know we got a couple of minutes though, Pastor Don. We were talking about a young man earlier and some of the trials and tribulations that he's going through. Uh, would you mind saying a prayer for him so that... Okay, I'm sorry, which, uh, which gentleman? Uh, Mr. Uh, Moron. Oh, uh, oh, Evan Morgan. I mean, yeah, Morgan. Yeah, let, let me tell you what's going on uh, with Mr. Morgan. You know, Donovan speaks a lot on his shows about a gentleman by the name of Evan Morgan. I mean, he's, um, he, you know, and, and in Donovan's show, and he, you know, basically, you know, kind of says what it is and the bad, bad mistakes that uh, Mr. Morgan has made in his life that's caused him to lose pretty much everything. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems like just recently he has been basically... Terminated in his, his position uh, as um, on the school board because uh, he now has more charges levied mm-hmm. against him when it comes to assault rifles. Uh, when it comes to uh, he also have an, has an assault against a woman in the yes. city of Corona burglary charges. burglary charges. And I've met with this man. I've met with him at a restaurant, and I sat there and I prayed with this man. And unfortunately, it seems like some of the bad choices he's made in his past is really coming up to, is really starting to bite him really badly right now. But he's, I, I'm, I'm, what we're concerned about, Donovan and I, is that he's in a desperate situation. And unfortunately, when we get desperate, we make even worse choices. So yeah, I would love to take a minute right now and let's pray for Evan, Evan Morgan. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to lift up uh, Evan Morgan to you today, Lord. Um, yes, Lord, he has made some bad choices. He's made choices that is against your will. But Lord, we have all made bad choices. Lord, we've all gone against your will at times of our lives. So Lord, I just want to lift this man up to you, Lord. I ask you, Lord, that he will seek you, especially now in this time of his life. Lord, I know he's struggling because he has lost his family. And I know he's struggling now with the law and now he's lost his reputation because of all these charges. But Lord, again, nothing is big, too big for you. Nothing is impossible with you. So Lord, I lift this man up. I ask you, Lord, that you will touch his heart, that he will seek you with all his heart, that he will change his ways and live more toward, for you, that he will seek counsel from passionate people of God that will send him in the right road, Lord, that he will be a, um, he, he will find you, Lord, and then he will live his life for you. Lord, we pray for this man. We pray that he changes his ways. And we pray, Lord, that in the future, you will touch his heart in a way that he will just be a, a amazing testimony about how you have lifted him up. Amen. We love you, Lord, and give you glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Don. I appreciate that. Uh, absolutely. And again, I want to thank all of you again for joining us for the Pastor Don Weekly Podcast Show. Again, you can hear it, audio. It will be coming out today over off of... Um, 
Uh, it'll be on the Pastor Don. It'll be on the uh, Reflections Ministries uh, Facebook page, we're live right now. and then we'll mm-hmm. and we're also going to have it on um, Spreaker and uh, YouTube and everywhere else. So thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any prayers, comments, questions, message me, call me. My number is on the page. Call Donovan. He can relate it. We'd love to be able be able to hear to build you up. Right. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. The Pastor Don Weekly devotional. We'll see you guys again next week. Be safe. Be uh, edified in Christ. And again, you got to believe it. It's real. God bless you guys.